Hello to everyone. Welcome you all. Uh, this is the second webinar provided by SP Turkey section. So today we have a special guest from Texas A&M. So he is the president of SP International for 2021. So Professor Thomas Blessing Game is with us. Uh, we kindly requested from him to give a talk on the fracture directed interactions. Now, uh, Dr. Blessing Kim will provide some brief information about his career and he will move on the fracture directed interactions there. So, dear participants, uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please put them on the comment. There will be uh, 15 minutes uh, for question part. So, now I give the mic microphone to Dr. Blessinke, just uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Hello everyone. I need to go into full screen mode, there we go. Uh, I appreciate everyone taking part of their Saturday to uh, join us. I. I'm uh, joining you from sunny, okay, very hot, uh, central Texas on a, a nice Saturday. It's actually a little bit cool outside, but uh, it's going to get really warm today. I know most of you are kind of wondering what's going to happen with the future and how the industry is going to look. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll probably talk more about technical things because those are the things we can control. Uh, we can't really control what the industry does or doesn't do but we can control what we do and getting ready for uh, when we all go back to work full time and when we all go back to uh, doing other kinds of things full time, uh, such as research and uh, application of technology and so forth, we need to be ready for that. So my advice throughout this conversation will be ready, uh, be ready to go back to work. So I was asked to speak on some work that we did on frack hits and this is sort of a a schizophrenic or a two brain problem. Uh, one was that I had an exceptional student a few years ago who worked on frack hits and he did, he de decided not to do a master of science. He only wanted to do a master of engineering, which was uh, fine for him. Not so good for me because I like to do a uh, master of science. I like to do uh, theses, which are very thorough, uh, but we compromised. He did a very uh, thorough uh, research project or master of engineering, uh, report and then he converted that into an SB paper or, or pardon me a UR tech paper that was uh, extremely well received this is all his work with uh, my guidance um, I don't take any credit for the the analysis the interpretations and so forth I, I just simply supervised him and gave him some guidance on how to write paper how to present the information how to discuss the information and so forth and what you're going to find is that frack hits are like um, everything else in life. You know, it's, it's unavoidable. These are um, whenever you have multiple wells in the same horizon. Generally speaking, we're talking about horizontal wells, which have a lot of fracture treatment stages. And these fracture treatment stages intersect each other. Um, there was a plan to reduce... Uh, frack hits by certain uh, logistical approaches. That is the way the wells were laid out. Uh, there were other plans to reduce frack hits by how the wells are uh, completed, the new wells or the, the so-called infill wells. Uh, we use the term parent and child a lot. The parent is the first well. The child, of course, is the infill well. Uh, some people say the original well. Some people say the infill well, but we'll cover all that. And then there have been many, many studies, some of which I'll cite. Uh, obviously, each person is trying to optimize uh, this behavior in their own environment. I just wanted to give you kind of a teaser about frack hits. When we end today, we'll talk a lot about what frack hits do and don't do um, in terms of uh, the damage or the, uh, the negative effect or the positive effect. And I'm sure that you've been taught or you've discussed that all successful unconventional plays, or I should say economically successful unconventional plays, have had some element of overpressure. And I need you to keep that fact in the back of your mind because that is going to affect how uh, frack hits are uh, seen and, and 
how they are enabled or disenabled. So first, let's talk a little bit. I know nobody likes to talk about themselves, especially not me. Uh, this is my bio I included in the presentation, which you'll be uh, welcome to have. Uh, but that's that's not very interesting. That's just words on a page. Let's let's talk a little bit about uh, what kind of uh, childhood I had, or whatever you might want to call it. Um, this is, you know, I ask people to make a chronology of their life, and I describe mine as a wasted life. I have to admit that wherever you grow up, you really believe that's the best place in the world. Doesn't matter what country, doesn't matter what city, doesn't matter what state, doesn't matter what province or county. Everybody pretty much loves where they grew up. And I grew up in a place in Louisiana that was uh, very quiet, um, had great, phenomenal parents, had uh, good uh, experiences as a child, had great family life, very large families on both sides. Um, but there's always going to be challenges. And, you know, I wasn't an easy child to deal with. Uh, you can see that in 1966, I started my career in petroleum engineering by uh, jabbing a can of spray paint with a screwdriver. Uh, that was not a good day. Uh, I also dropped a match in a can of gas, uh, gasoline, pardon me, or petrol, as you might say. Uh, that was on the order of one of the stupidest things I ever did. Um, my father brought home a skunk, which is an animal indigenous to North America, which has a awful smell it can spray you and you'll smell for weeks but this one had the sprayer taken out of it but this these skunks are wild and uh let's just say it didn't end well uh, he either bit or scratched everybody that he came into contact with and ultimately escaped um on a dare when i was uh, 12 years old i jumped out of a, a, a high tree into a river in louisiana and i still regret it to this day when I was a little bit older, I decided to pretend to commit suicide and jump off of a, a, a motorway bridge onto some train cars below. And it was a lot of fun, uh, but we caused uh, a lot of people on the motorway to have emotional responses. I'm surprised we uh, didn't have a visit from the police, but I certainly did have visits from police later on. I began uh, experimenting with... Uh, well, let's just say I, I made a homemade bomb that didn't work out very well. So I came to Texas A&M when I was 17 years old, uh, almost 18, but 17, in fact. It was uh, a tough year, the second year. Uh, first year was kind of, you know, not so great, but the second year, well, it was just truly awful. I uh, kept expecting to be asked not to come back. Um, it created my rule that I uh, never study with anyone stupider than you. Uh, by a couple of years later, things really all came together, and I was taking uh, a lot of hours and really working hard, and I, I finally uh, got it, you know, if you want to call it that. Um, I decided to go to grad school because there were no jobs. Uh, I'll talk about that a little more on the next page, but um, I really, really enjoyed graduate school. There are some people that hate graduate school. My wife hated graduate school. Uh, she eventually became a medical doctor because medical school is like going to undergrad for another four years. Uh, they tell you where to sit, what to think, what to do. She loves that. But I loved every second of graduate school. I loved it so much that I took two and a half years to get my master's, which wasn't exactly uh, fast. Um, I probably should have been a geology student. I did a little historical footnote. I started a software company with a classmate. And yes, I probably could have been Kappa or uh, Kappa, uh, sorry, Kappa Engineering in France or IHS Fiquette in Canada. But we were young and it just frankly didn't work out. Um, he wanted to make a lot of money and I wanted to write software, but that was okay. We parted friends and that was a very long time ago, as you can see. PhD took another three years and at that point I probably should have been a geology student. Um, then a few other things happened. You know, I became a young faculty member. That was kind of a weird time. Uh, there were no jobs then either. And uh, I lost a close friend of mine, got a really big first grant, had an administrative appointment, and they decided they hated me. And it was because I wouldn't, uh, I always spoke truth to power, you know, and older, more experienced people didn't like that very much. But I thought I did a pretty good job. Uh, but, you know, that's okay. Sometimes you're not suited to things and, and I'm fine being a, a, a nomad, sort of a, a nomadic warrior, if you want to think about it that way. 
started wearing the overalls in 2006. And, you know, frankly, it's because I wanted to. Uh, I liked it and I enjoyed life. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm old enough. I'm not going to change. In 2009, I moved my family to New Zealand with absolutely no plan. Uh, I needed to get my wife uh, in a different place. I needed a little change for my kids. So I did it. And my point is, don't be afraid to change. You know, we had no plan. Yeah, we both are, were well into our careers and everything worked out. But, um, you know, you move 10,000 miles away, there's always a reason. And maybe sometime if you buy me some liquor, I'll tell you what the reason was, but not today. So my career in terms of uh, my background, as most of you probably know, um, I don't you know, take any obscene pride in this, but it's the truth. Uh, I did create what became RTA. Uh, I visited with my professor in 1983 and he gave me an idea. He never even spoke to me. He just reached up into his bookshelf, took a book out, flipped some pages, stuck a piece of paper in it. There were no post-it notes then and handed me the book and then didn't let go of it. And he said exactly precisely two things. He said, once you figured out everything that's in this paper, then come back and see me. And then he said, and bring my book back. And that was it. So I started working on that and it was a very interesting idea. It was how to um, account for a, a production history prior to a buildup you know, okay. In the whole scheme of things, it's well established. It was well established at the time you would use superposition or some sort of a trick. Well, eventually that led to the realization that you could use, um, production data for, uh, an analysis, just like you could pressure transient data. And I began playing with that. I began playing with decline curve analysis. And I, I would admit that, you know, I don't, do reserves. I don't do uh, a lot of other analyses. I build tools. And so, you know, I was very um, committed to showing that this methodology worked. And I had taken Dr. Wattenbarger's simulation class and he helped me write a simulator that was essentially an analytical solution. So I generated, you know, every simulated solution I could think of to test this thing, even random uh, sequences of rates and pressures and anything you could think of. And I was so proud of myself. I went back to my advisor and I said, look at what I've done. And he basically told me it was crap, which is a nice word for, you know, other things. And unless I could prove it analytically. So I spent the summer of 1985 working on an analytical proof. And I say, thank God for Muscat because I found Muscat's book. He had a solution that was, um, you could perform calculus on. So I did that and made the proof. And then I wrote all of these papers that you can see. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but all these papers for about the next 10 years on this methodology. And it occurred to me in creating this methodology, actually, I was going to uh, work on it uh, as a pressure transient test. So it was plotted pressure drop divided by rate. And then I get this phone call in 1992. And it is uh, Mike Fekovich, Dr. Fekovich, who died recently. And he was screaming at me that, you know, you do not plot production data going up, you plot it going down. And I said, well, it's not the production data that's going up. It's the product, you know, the reciprocal productivity index or the, and he just said, I don't care. You're going to do it this way, or, you know, I'm going to crush you like a grape. So I said, okay, fine. And I then began producing type curves as decline curves. And I also continued to produce others. But the long story short is in 1997, I got tired of waiting. So I wrote my own software and I am not, I mean, okay, maybe back then I was okay, but certainly now I've forgotten everything. I was not an expert in software, uh, still wouldn't be, but I wrote it. I bought the libraries with my own money. I did all this other stuff and I gave it away for years as shareware. And I was trying to get someone to take this and create a computer program. So I visited Fiquette in 1999 and I gave a two day short course and it was in Calgary and they, we were basically locked in a very small room with about 20 people. And I went through everything I had done, never heard from them again. Um, so I said, fine, that's great. No problem. I had a student who was really bright at the time and he uh, worked out that we needed to do multi-well uh, decline curve analysis. That was fine. 
a couple of years later, I get this CD, uh, compact disc, for those of you who don't remember what that is, from Fiquette with uh, this program RTA. I put it in the computer, ran a couple of cases, took it out of the computer, put it in a pouch, and threw it in a box on top of my uh, shelves. And I said, this is, this is insane. You know, they've made this so easy that, um, you know, anybody could do it, maybe even my Chihuahua dog. Uh, continue to work on that a little more, began working with uh, both Fiquette and Kappa a little bit. Nothing substantive, just sort of as a, a friendly advisor, if you want to call it that. And nothing really happened. But now, as you know, we have to use RTA for the analysis of unconventional wells because pressure transient analysis really isn't practical or popular, uh, you know, possible given the uh, times and the ultra low permeabilities and so forth. So next was um, some effort on career trajectories. And I just wanted to go through and kind of give you some guidance on careers. So this is career process on our progress on the uh, Y axis time on the X. And you, know, you have very low ambition people, low ambition people, and then modest ambition people. So these are sort of normal ish people, if you want to think about it that way. And then you have the stair step people. They usually become executives. They take these little steps and they just keep going up and up and up and up. So, you know, this, this is my definition of an executive. They may take small steps, but they just keep going up. And then there's entrepreneurs. And I've known a lot of entrepreneurs. And this, again, is career progress and time. They have a product. They push it really hard. They have a nice rise and then crack. Something just doesn't click. So they start over and then they do it again. And then they crack, then they start over and do it again. And I've seen this throughout my career. They take failure as a part of the problem. And failure could be bankruptcy. It could be, um, you know, having to reduce your company size, as many companies have. It may be that uh, you have to develop new products. Uh, one friend of mine has been extraordinary. I give him full credit that every time I thought he had reached his peak, you know, he came up with another idea and then another idea. Very, very uh, good uh, way to, to live if you can take the downs. So this is my career. And you can see I left Louisiana, which was a big thing. And then I had some ups and downs in school and, you know, career wise, little bumps here and there, made people mad, got fired twice, you know, this and that. And then now, uh, you know, out of some something that I would have never foreseen, uh, I get uh, selected as the 2021 SBE president. And, you know, I, I've made this graph a long time ago, but I really believe this is what my career is going to look like. Uh, suffice it to say, I see myself very modestly. And my goal is to help other people reach their goals. So that was way too much time. I apologize. Let's talk about frat kids. So, Whenever I was preparing these notes on frack hits, I was trying to think about what would make you happy if I were you. Well, I'd want to know what other people had done. And so let's start by, there was a, an interview with Brendan Elliott, who uh, is um, a reservoir completions engineer with Devon Energy. And he gave this interview uh, last year in April. And I won't go through the discussion of the completion strategies, but I will talk a little bit about development decisions. So he was looking at, you know, how can we reduce frack hits? So a wider well spacing, which by the way, is probably what's going to win. And then staggered wells, which is what they call a wine rack or a gun barrel configuration. In this case, it would be, um, you know, so maybe, and I'll show you with my hands, this would be wider well spacing. You spread the wells out. And then this would be the stacked or uh, wine rack or gun barrel configuration. And then someone came up with an idea of cube development. Cube development is where you put all your wells in at once and you bring them on. And there is interference. We need to make sure we understand uh, there is interference. But it's not the kind of interference that occurs when you have a much older parent well and you bring a child on and the child is not nearly as strong as the parent. The, in a cube development, uh, you can have uh, some wells that are stronger than others, but in general, you'll have a, an issue of capacity. You'll have to pay a lot more for it. Uh, you'll have to be able to process a lot more fluid initially, but also you have to recognize that if your spacing is too tight or too 
uh, close together, then these wells will interfere almost from beginning. I would say personally that, you know, cube development sounded like a really good idea. The first time I saw it, it wasn't a cube per se. It was more of a slab and the company had decided to put a whole bunch of wells in uh, like this and bring them on all at once. And uh, it was pretty, it was pretty amazing. I have to admit to watch that. But now cube is, is of course going to be staggered a lot of wells, maybe even four to five stacks of wells. There's another uh, aspect, which is called rolling development, which would sort of be uh, where you would time your infill development as to not uh, have so much a depletion effect. Um, okay, that, that works too. Uh, I'll leave the discussion for slow back, which is to uh, bring wells on slowly for another day. Uh, that's, that's a completely different subject. That's drawdown and pressure management, something that has to be done. Um, you know, really whenever you're trying to minimize the uh, near uh, uh, early time effect of wells interfering with each other, and they will. I mean, these wells are heavily stimulated. There's a geologic component to it. There's also the completion component to it. I mean, you put this much water and sand in the ground, things are going to intersect each other. You're going to have a tremendous interaction in some cases. You add to that the possibility of geologic faults or geologic pathways. Uh, you could have well completion issues as well. The goal really is to create some sort of an optimal scheme for, um, you know, the development that maximizes your overall recovery and sort of minimizes any uh, interruptions to that, if I could call it that. So again, wider well spacing and tighter well spacing. Uh, that's those have both been greatly debated in the last five years. Staggered wells came into effect uh, maybe six, seven years ago, but uh, the, it's the norm now as well. And then this cube development idea, which was, you know, look, I hate to say it looked great on paper, but if you really want to understand cube development, you have to go look at what happened whenever certain companies put on uh, large scale cube development experiments and the performance was much less than expected. And the reason was, is they put the wells very close to each other. And when they did that, they had tremendous interference, even from the beginning. Enough about that. So what can you do to mitigate brackets? Uh, there's the do nothing, uh, which is, you know, of course, my favorite thing because I'm lazy. The parent well is, um, you know, you're just going to leave it alone. You're not going to do anything. Uh, you might shut it in. Um and generally speaking, the child well will probably underperform 20 to 40 percent. I've seen this as little as 10 and as much as, you know, just terrible. I've, I've seen a couple of cases that were just completely horrible child wells. I don't want to say they were 90 percent underperforming, but they were definitely uh, surprises. Um, so the do nothing probably not going to be the most popular thing, but depending on circumstances and right now, circumstances are pretty tough. That might be what people do. Some people preload the parent well, they'll inject a certain volume of fluid, uh, maybe a small volume of fluid. Um, I want to say on the order of a few hundred barrels. And then the same thing is pretty much um, happening with the child well, because it still feels the depletion from the parent, but the parent well is not as punished or not as uh, affected by the child well. Uh, large volume preloads, and then, you know, they're saying that you'll have slightly less effect or slightly less loss of performance uh, due to the child well. That may be true. And then you can recharge the parent, which is to completely, uh, during the entire treatment um, of the child well, you'll continue to in inject small volumes, maybe one to three barrels a minute into the parent well. Uh, this does improve significantly the uh, hydraulic fracture symmetry, and that is one of the things that this diagram is attempting to show over here, is that by creating a stress field, uh, the fractures will not propagate over into uh, the parent well. Uh, this is They're showing the opposite, but I'm trying to explain that if you were to recharge the pressure over here, then what will happen is uh, you know, you'll keep these fractures from following the path of least stress resistance and intersecting the parent well directly. Refracturing the parent well, uh, this had a lot of traction. There are still a few 
uh, people that are at strongly advocating refracturing. Uh, the real problem is with refracturing is you must spend money on the parent well. You cannot simply inject fluid into the parent well and hope for the best. You need to, uh, you may have to cement the well and reperforate. You may have to put some sort of a liner sequence in it and reperforate. But you're, if you're going to do a refracture treatment correctly, you're going to have to have pressure isolation so that you can get uh, the fluid and the propant where you need it, not where you think. So this is, you know, a simple idea that you might bullhead in several thousand barrels of fluid and sand as a refracture treatment. I don't think that's going to be particularly successful. There are obviously going to be people that argue with it, but uh, I, I think you need to be very careful uh, with how and where and when you refracture. And the, the when obviously is prior to the child well, the how is, you know, what you do in, in, in the context of do you simply bullhead fluid in, which of course is probably not the best idea. Do you recomplete the well with a liner? Do you go in and squeeze off everything and, and shoot your perfs again? It, it, it can range from all of those. And there are tools, there are vendors with certain kinds of equipment that can help you with that. Okay. So now we're going to look at a few uh, case histories. And, you know, the authors of these case histories were kind enough to uh, make it color coded. So red is bad, green is good. Red is bad, green is good. And I can tell you that uh, I did a lot of work in the part of this particular play, the Eagle for Shale, where um, there's a lot of red. I won't say where, but you know, there it there the, the Eagle for Shale has a very high pressure uh, section here where geologically in Carnes County, the um, the reservoir drops uh, to a, a very low depth. Uh, over in this range, uh, the reservoir is not nearly as deep. Uh, up in here, we're almost getting into um, what we call uh, our area, Brazos County. It's a little bit further over here. Um, but you can see that the green cases are generally speaking where uh, there's a higher pressure uh, or, you know, higher initial pressure, higher geo pressure, if you want to call it that. So we come to the Haynesville and we're going to talk about the Haynesville a lot more when we talk about it, my students project. But the Haynesville actually has a lot of green uh, almost everywhere. It's evenly distributed. And the Haynesville, you have to remember, is a very high pressure. Um, shale it, it I, I was stumbling for words because i wanted to say it's almost lithostatically pressured there are some places in this part of the haynesville shale where you approach the uh the lithostatic gradient of the um the earth so you know it's approximately one psi so this is very very highly overpressured in fact when you core over in this part, uh, you don't get a core back. You get something that looks like uh, poker chips or circular pieces of rock because there's uh, pieces in between that have no stress capacity and they literally explode and these, these rocks come out basically in, in these, uh, these circular pieces. Now, I will tell you, if you're paying close attention, this is the Texas border, and you can see that there's a little bit of development over here in Texas. Uh, there's a part of this play that extends down into here, and then there's a part of the play uh, in Texas. I did look a lot at the Texas side, a bit at the Louisiana side here, and then uh, quite a bit over here um, later on. Everybody always asks, why are there no wells here? It's because this formation dips from about 10 to 11,000 feet, 12,000 feet, down to about 17,000 feet. So, you know, the, there's still plenty of potential for development down here but we're going to have to invent to, new tools, new uh, ways of, of uh, completing wells in this kind of a formation. And we're also, quite frankly, going to have to have economics which support that. $2 natural gas or even $3 natural gas is not going to support that. But the important thing is to realize that most Haynesville stimulations were uh, positive. Uh, so this is a, a good thing. This, or Sorry, uh, most Haynesville uh, frack hits were positive. I, I apologize for my mix of nomenclature so when they put a child well in and you intersected the parent the 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 nature of that was positive 
Also, uh, the same thing happened in the Bakken. And I'm going to tell you that I am not a Bakken shale person. The Bakken shale is not significantly overpressured, but there is a, a part of the Bakken. It's called the Three Forks. Uh, there's also a part of the, the Bakken shale itself, which is much higher reservoir quality. Um, and that could be why these uh, there's so much green over here. It is not a, a highly overpressured area from what I understand. And it is relatively uniform. I, from what I understand, the oil properties uh, across the play are not significantly different. Uh, but my guess is it would be the much higher reservoir quality here. Uh, now, when we come down to the Woodford, the Woodford is a low pressure, a lower pressure gas shale. This is all in Oklahoma. And you can see that almost all of the frac kits here were negative. So I spent quite a bit of time on this slide, but I wanted you to get the idea that frac kits can be either good or bad. And it's hard to explain until you're in this situation. You don't have a choice when you have a parent-child well sequence or an infill original well sequence. You have to stimulate and you have to take some precautions. You have to do some things to ensure that, you know, that stimulation is successful. You're stimulating the child, of course, but there have been a number of places where there's high success. And of course, this part of the Haynesville, this part of the Eagleford and this uh, highlighted part of the Bakken. Okay. So in, in Toto in the Bakken, 50% were positive, 24% of the Eagleford, 58% of the Haynesville, as I alluded to, 4% of the Woodford. So this is not good. The Niobrara I did not show, but it is also a slightly overpressured uh, reservoir in Colorado. It basically sits underneath, um, where uh, Denver and north of Denver are. Uh, it is um, a, a play that had 5,000 vertical wells in it. It's not substantially depleted to the point of uh, where it's not profitable, but there, and, and obviously thousands of wells have been drilled in the Niobrara or Codell sequence, and they've been, uh, they're very predictable. Their performance is good. Uh, but again, it doesn't really have the pressure support. The Codell is a much higher reservoir quality in general than the Niobrara, but um, I'm not surprised that frac kits are so negative in the Niobrara. I'm not as familiar with the Woodford other than to talk about it. So no change or neutral, about 35%, 36% in the Haynesville. I'm oh, sorry, in the Eagleford, 24% in the Haynesville. In the Woodford, about 32%. And then in the Niobrara, uh, about 38 So negative, 56, 64, 19, 41, and 15. So I'd like for you to remember the number 58 plus 24 is approximately 82. Um, we're going to come back and talk about that in a minute. So just to kind of give you some guidance, you know, it really depends on the play. Um, again, the high pressure part of the Eagleford generally been successful. High pressure part of the Haynesville generally been uh, very successful. Uh, the other plays, not so much. Uh, they just, uh, th they're lower pressure, um, probably more depleted probably because there's uh, this is a gas play. Um, the Bakken, again, I think is higher reservoir quality in general. Okay, we're going to leave this one, but we're going to come back and talk about the Haynesville in a, in a few minutes and just uh, be patient with me on that. So now I just wanted to show you really quickly that uh, King et al. and many others have uh, taken, and the red is always the infill well, uh, the red is is where they're injecting. This is the injection pressure, the casing pressure in the infill well. And the blue is the pressure in the uh, the parent well. So the blue would sort of like be the background uh, pressure in a depleted zone, you know, in a depleted uh, region or depleted volume some distance away from uh, the, uh, the child. Uh, I'm not saying it's depleted to the point of not being productive. I'm just saying that there's pressure loss in that region. So what this gives you is kind of an idea of what communication looks like. So, you know, these pumping sequences, they all go up to the same pressure. They're all varied somehow starting up, you know, putting prop in and so forth. Sorry, I don't have a zoom view, but you can see, okay, there's an initial increase. There's an initial increase. And then it just suddenly drops back. Not really sure what happened there, but generally speaking, the, the parent and the child are not communicating very well. And then over here, bang, you have another one where it, it actually does, the, there's an instantaneous communication with the child well. 
In this case, you can see there's almost continuous increasing pressure. The uh, child well injection profile, injection pressure profile is here. And you can see that it just keeps sawtoothing every time they change the pressure in the child well, you get a corresponding change in the parent well, which essentially is an observer. Um, okay, that's really interesting, uh, but it's also about what would, I would say this is more or less normal to my expectations. Then we come over to these Permian Basin wells, and you see there's not much, the pressure's just falling off, falling off, falling off, falling off, falling off, falling off in the, uh, parent well but you can see okay i know you're there i can you know you can see there's a small blip there's a small blip there's a small blip okay there's a little bit bigger blip but this could be building what they call a pressure wall so there's sort of a you know it's it's stopped de declining and and sort of stabilized and it's feeling each one of these new stages in the child well and then bang it hits this uh this particular stage hits the parent well this is the kind of thing that you're really looking out for is whenever you have this big hit from an offset, um, you know, sometimes they look more like this. There's just a continuous sort of, uh, you turn, you know, you change the, the stage over here and you just pick it up as an observation here. There's really no observation until it builds up what I would again, call a pressure wall. And you're seeing each one of these new stages gives it a tiny bump and then bang, you get a big hit from that. And then what they've done is they've taken this particular section and zoomed in over here and they're looking at the second that this well began injection, it, there was a direct conduit to the offset. So this feature right here is from turning on the pumps over here and it immediately intersects or immediately uh, communicates with the offset. They turn the pumps off, and it drops off, you know, as a comment, um, you know, people ask me for research ideas all the time. Uh, there apparently has been, and I say apparently, but I know the references. There have been a few articles recently looking at the red pressure, the fall off pressure drop after you turn the pumps off. Some people feel like that is a, like a continuous defit. So it's a single, uh, stage fracture treatment. And somehow you would try to use that to interpret uh, reservoir and fracture properties. I just wanted to mention, you know, that uh, even recently there have been some papers on analyzing this red uh, pressure profile where the, the pumps are off and there's a background pressure drop. But you can see you're in direct communication with the offset. So this really isn't um, Darcy's law, everybody. This is Pazuye's law. You guys remember Pazuye's law? Pazuye's law was for flow in pipes. I know there's a a variation of Pazuye's law for flow in channels, but this is what this would be. This is not Darcy's law. You're not flowing through a porous media. You're injecting water and propant at this point, and it is going directly. It is sending a signal. You have a direct line of communication with the offset. So, you know, this, this is something you have to think about from a practical standpoint. Okay. Now we're going to talk about what does this look like? And Whitfield et al. wrote a really nice paper on sort of whether a frac hit is positive or negative, but also what damage it can do. And they had some nice photographs. You ruined a gas lift mandrel. You ruined some valves. Uh, they actually buckled the tubing. You can see its shape here. And then you can see the packer assembly was destroyed. These are all by offset frac hits. I mean, there's an enormous amount of pressure. Look at the, the surface pressure. If we come back here, the surface pressures are up even close to 10,000 PSI. So you can imagine what it's like down hole. Well, they actually split the casing in these two cases uh, that they're showing and they pulled the casing out. So this is due to hydraulic pressure from the offset. So this is an enormous amount of pressure that they're putting on these systems. So one of the things that, that Whitfield et al. were trying to do, and of course uh, I, there were a Slumberjay paper, I believe, they were showing that these green wells, which are the new uh, child wells, and then what they did to mitigate them. And they did preload some of the wells, they shut in some of the wells, and they were trying to show how they were protecting themselves. So these were all shut in, but some of them also had 
you can see by the SI. Some of them also had preloads, so that's 20,000 barrels, 10,000 barrels, 20,000 barrels, and so on. So they had a plan to uh, sort of isolate this region with pressure. Uh, they did inject into the parents, and they did shut in all of the parents around it. And the goal was, of course, to, uh, to protect the parents and to ensure that the children had ample opportunity to, uh, you know, intersect new rock and not simply, you know, have a fracture progress over here. We'll talk about that more in a little while. So they also described, and I know this is really hard to read, but they described mitigation methods. So they had continuous injection, they had preloads, they had just well shut in, which is in gray. So this is just shutting in the wells. That would be all of these. And then whether there was a positive or a negative effect. And so for the wells that were just shut in, it was pretty much negative or maybe neutral. But for the wells that were preloaded, there was actually a tremendous positive effect. Some, sometimes even um, 100 barrels a day, more fluid were produced. Now, I can tell you, when we look at the next section on the Haynesville, there were cases where there was significant improvement in gas flow rate during uh, or for the in the parent well as caused by the uh, child well and i've seen cases where the um, the prior rate in the parent well was multiplied by four or even five by a frack hit in the haynesville from the child and of course what that really tells you is that it kind of cleaned out the fracture system and it kind of uh, intersected if you want to think about it the um uh the, the new or the virginish reservoir rock. Okay, so now we'll talk about the Haynesville frac study. And this is something done by my student and myself, 2017. And you can't say frac it anymore, but everybody still does. And there was a, a team that was founded under Ali Donashi, who's a consultant. And now we're supposed to say fracture directed interactions, which is a polite word for frac it. Um, and they have been pushing this change in nomenclature because we got really negative uh, image in the, the technical and the financial literature by the word frack hit. It became uh, a very negative, uh, you know, connotation. So we had a, a small group of us meet in his office a couple of times, and we went through all of the aspects of uh, frack hits and, uh, you know, came up with new nomenclature, came up with some guidance on other issues that I mentioned earlier, how to mitigate uh, frack hits or FDIs and so on. So just kind of a point of conversation. So in this case, there are um, frack hits were rated using the following metrics. So there's a low frack hit, which will be a green or a sort of turquoise color. And then there's a high frack hit uh, relationship, which is um, shown in red. And what this really means is the degree of well-to-well -well hydraulic fracture interference. So red is bang. You definitely know you had a frack hit. It was, um, it was significant. Um, now, rank and effect are two different things. What this is really saying is sort of like an earthquake scale. Did you feel it over here maybe? Sorry. And then did it destroy your house over here? Well, that's not really fair. I shouldn't, I shouldn't rank it quite that high. But if you see a rank one or if you see something in red that we're talking about in the subsequent slides, that means there was a direct observation of a fracket. For example, this would be a, uh, a number one. There is obviously a tremendous, these are date and gas rate and pressure plots. There's an obvious uh, hit. Uh, this is the parent well production profile. It was flattening out. After the frack hit, it jumped way up. So not only is it rank one, but it also had a significant improvement in production behavior. Okay. This would be another one that would also be a positive. Uh, uh, it would be rank two uh, in their mind because, okay, you had a pressure um, that's the in black. You see the pressure jump but you see only a slight improvement in rate. And it actually, although, you know, all of us who are reservoir engineers see that this trend is much higher than this trend, it, it roughly mimics this. So it's sort of put it back on trend, but then out here it's about the same. So this would be a rank two. 
and then a rank three would be something where yes you see something happen you can see there was an intersection you know or, or an interruption or a, an effect in the pressure but the gas rate itself in the parent although there was a initial recovery and it probably could have been from just being shut in and reopened uh, there wasn't any long-term change. Actually, there wasn't even much of a near-term change. Okay, and then of course you can see that the uh, and sorry for the coloration, but blue was all I could think of for the uh, maybe we should have done pink. Blue is the uh, gas well rate for the new uh, or the the child well, and you see there's a slight improvement, but not very much. So that would be rank three, and then rank one is I know you did something because I saw it on the pressure but the rate didn't change at all, nor did the cumulative in the parent. So all of these rankings are relative to um, what happened to the parent. And again, uh, don't correlate it this way, but a rank one, generally uh, what we're going to investigate is, does it have a positive or a negative effect? And none of these have negative effects, but there will be a few that do have negative effects. So the way we rank this, is the tubing uh, tubing pressure after the frac hit. So if you see a jump in the tubing pressure, which you did here, which you did here, which you did here, which you did here, gas rate uplift after the fracture uh, treatment, which is here or the frac hit. Uh, there's a little bit here, a little bit here, almost nothing there. And then the 12-month cumulative production. So he's tracking the cumulative production to see what it looks like, which is also you could gauge it off of the rate. And then what does the, uh, the cumulative production look like before and after? And again, that's just a ratio. So the next slide shows, and it's a little bit complicated, so I apologize. Before the frac hit, rank one wells were not doing very well. So these are the ones that took the biggest hit. The color coding is the same as before. So it's, it's red, gold, blue, and green. And, and green in this case is uh, wells that weren't affected. So these wells would have had a high flow rate um, and they just, for some reason, you know, they're, they're doing their own thing and they're not feeling this. But wells that have a low flow rate, they feel that frack hit. And the reason is pressure. The pressure itself, if you look, the pressure corresponding to these rates is much higher. The pressure corresponding uh, to these rates is much lower. These pressures are all in the, the very low range down here on the order of uh, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. That's, uh, of course, a calculated bottom hole pressure. So these wells are, uh, they're, they're not producing very much. They're at a low calculated bottom hole pressure. But these wells are producing high, and they're at a relatively high uh, bottom hole pressure. Average is noted and everything else. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Well, whenever you have this, uh, this frack hit, the more depleted wells actually benefit greater. So the size of the bubble is the cumulative production uplift from the frack hit. So all of the red cases are low pressure and all of the green cases are high pressure. The green cases don't have hardly any uplift and the red cases all have significant uplift. They much improved over, over time. The distance between wells is something we'll talk about in a moment. So in this case, you know, you could argue the biggest circles are going to be the farthest way. Okay, I'll buy that. Um, the smaller circles, in, in the past, most wells were on 1,000 to 1,500 uh, spacing. Some would have been a little bit different. Louisiana has slightly different rules about development, and then these uh, wells would have been in a different pattern. They would have been... Uh, not in not a nearby well. They would have been uh, perhaps you know again we have these uh, these issues in the states. Um, and generally speaking, states have rules where you're built on a, a one square mile grid. It is uh, something that was you know hung over from past. So at first, before uh, you were allowed to change your uh, spacing of your your sections. Uh, people were drilling wells on a per section basis. So these uh, might have been one well per section, and these might have been a full pattern of wells per section. And then someone went in, or an almost full pattern went back in and added another well. So just to give you an idea uh, before we close, this is gas flow rate versus cumulative gas production. This well is decreasing production, obviously, it's dropping fairly quickly. 
and linearly, I might add, the frac hit occurs and it pushes it actually beyond the initial rate. So this is a very positive occurrence. This particular well had a trend that would have predicted out like this. The child is brought on and there is no positive recovery. It actually um, loses significant volume to the child well. Now we know that this happens in conventional uh, reservoirs all the time. So this shouldn't be a surprise that it happens in unconventional but the question is why? Is it the fracture system? Is it the reservoir quality? And as I mentioned, this is an extremely high pressure environment. It's also a much higher reservoir quality. Some of these permeabilities are actually on the order of a micro Darcy, so a thousand nano Darcy's. So it, it could be something more like that. But obviously, this to me looks like uh, the fracture system that the child well uh, created and intersected has uh, stolen, for lack of a better word, gas from the parent. There are several that are neutral. There was a slight uptick uh, here after the frac hit or after the child well was completed, but it essentially goes back on trend. And then there's another one where you don't even see a response. It just stays right on trend. So sometimes there were neutral and negative behaviors, but for the most part, and we'll talk about that in a second, almost all of the frac hits were positive. So there were some uh, attempts to... Uh, create stress barriers, which I mentioned before, which would be injecting fluid into the parents. Uh, there were there was a program of refracturing the parent wells. Um, there are several case histories of that in the Eagleford and in the Permian. Uh, others, again, were preloading, shutting in the well, uh, well before you uh, you performed the uh, stimulation on the the child well, and then actually injecting gas into the parent well. I'm not really sure how many of those were done. A lot of people don't like to inject gas or hydrocarbons back into an existing borehole. Um, this one shows that although um, this uh, stress barrier concept was used, it, it, it did have some effect. You can see that the rates between the two wells, this is the parent and this is the child, they were very comparable. So probably that's a, a good thing. Um, I, I would say that stress barrier treatments have proven to be very expensive and are not always successful, but in this case, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, indicate that, um, you know, by using a stress barrier, the profile for, um, uh, the, uh, parent well is much higher than it was before. So there's actually a great benefit. Okay. Some more comments on, uh, unconventional reservoir development. A lot of people ask me what's the tightest well spacing I've ever seen. And so I drew this from memory. Um, someone asked me to look at a set of data where it was in a uh, sort of a, a, a piece of pie shaped uh, lease. And remember leases are owned by surface landowners. So this was kind of a strange configuration. Uh, so the short ends, were 400 feet apart, maybe even 250 feet apart, and then 400 feet apart. And then they were all at approximately 650 feet apart, which would have been the limits of the spacing out here. So it was just an odd space, uh, odd shape lease. They injected 10 million pounds of sand per well. And this was at a time when people were not injecting that much sand. It would have been on the order of 2014. Uh, they injected an enormous volume of sand uh, into each well and thereby creating, and I didn't include slides on this, but they would have created essentially a, a reservoir fracture network throughout here. It, it, it was an enormous amount of well stimulation. And the reason that this company contacted me is that the producing point over here, the wells come out, you know, come up, the producing point, each of the wells had essentially the same surface pressure and the same rate. And if they shut in this well, all the other wells increased rate and pressure. And so they were saying to me, you know, what, what happened here? Why, why, uh, why did this occur? And I, I looked at it for about five minutes and I said, you know, this is obvious that you've created this enormous sub reservoir. People call it stimulated reservoir volume, but they created this enormous stimulated reservoir volume. 
and you know they had all these wells are in communication just like they would be in a conventional well system and then early on in the development of unconventionals we were at a an industry presentation it was actually a sort of a small conference if you want to call it that and uh, this gentleman gets up and he puts his slide down and this is the uh, the child well so this is the well being stimulated and then 5,700 feet away, which if memory serves me is about a kilometer and a half, um, there's a producing well that shows an immediate hit to rate and pressure. And he put the slide, you know, it was the old time slides. He put it on the screen and then he realized what he had done. He looked at it and he, he quickly took it off and you know, several people jumped up and said, hey, wait a minute, put that back up. We want to understand what happened. And he said, uh, you know, it, I should have never put that slide in the deck. If if uh, if I put that slide back up, I'll be fired, you know, and he uh, continued on with the rest of his presentation. But a lot of people couldn't understand that a mile away, actually a bit more than a mile or a kilometer and a half away at this time, 2009, that you could inject well uh, fluid and propant at this point and affect a well, um, you know, 6,000 feet away or a kilometer and a half of, uh, away. And again, you know, this became common. This was not an unusual circumstance. So as I finish, you know, people always say, well, what's the longest distance you've ever seen a frack hit? And the longest distance I've ever seen a frack hit, that's one where I was asked to review the data, was about 10,000 feet. This uh, frack hit actually crossed seven other wells, but the eighth well had bottom hole pressure and temperature. And you did see some effect in the tubing head pressure of some of these seven wells. And then you actually saw a slight response in tubing head pressure for the uh, ninth well, which was another 500 feet beyond the well with a gauge. So I can't really show you this because it's confidential, but imagine that you have eight wells, you stimulate this one and this one takes, uh, sorry, I, I'm not very coordinated. You stimulate this well, the pinky over here and this well over here shows a tremendous uh, evidence, uh, both in pressure and in temperature. So, you know, that is a very long way to see something. So, so everybody always asks me, does tight spacing work? And I, I wrote these slides a little while ago, about a year ago. And, you know, I said, yes, but uh, it comes at a cost. Uh, the wells need to be brought on as simultaneously as possible. I need everybody to understand when the reservoir quality gets strong and you start bringing on wells that are uh, able to communicate there will always be a favored well and that favored well will be the first one that's brought on. And, uh, you know, I did several studies uh, for people about this. So you will be able to see these, um, these initial wells or the wells that come on first generally produce best. Now, in some cases that is not true in some zones or in some landings or in some formations, uh, you know, like we said before, this idea of a cube or of a, uh, you know, a, a vertical, uh, a, sorry, a, a simply a, a pattern layout works well, but in some cases, whenever you're dealing with very high uh, quality reservoir rock, you're in communication. You can act, I, I can tell you, you can actually see yourself draining the water off of some of these cases, like the wells that come on later actually show less water production as well. So the next question is, does PTA, RTA work in shales? And it's another yes, but. Everybody always says, okay, why are you so hard on wanting bottom hole pressure? And I presume everybody on this call is, or on this webinar, recognizes the value of having a sensor at the formation or near the formation, measuring things, temperature and pressure. And I know people say, well, you know, it shouldn't have to be required, but in a way it should. The cost is not that significant, but if you're going to try to perform uh, pressure transient analysis, I'm going to have to say, yes, you're going to have to have bottom hole pressure because there's too much going on in these wells with three phase flow in order to be able to estimate anything without using bottom hole pressure. Now, 
On the other hand, and I will, you know, everybody accuses me of always talking out both sides of my mouth. RTA will work with surface pressures, done it thousands of times. Uh, it will work with using surface pressures and converting them to bottom hole pressure, done that thousands of times. But you have to accept that there will be some misinterpretation. Now, everybody on this call who's done these analyses remembers that all of this analysis is done in terms of pressure drop for uh, RTA. So what you'd really be looking at is some sort of a skin factor or some sort of alteration. I'm not saying that the permeability and fracture half link and so forth from RTA is unique and perfect, but I'm saying that I'm less concerned about permeability, fracture half length and so forth in RTA than I am about whatever skin factor or non-ideality you calculate. The issue with uh, skin factor, uh, sorry, with fracture half length and permeability in these cases is the models uh, have so many parameters in them that these two uh, parameters, they become sort of a lumped and you have to have a strategy on how you're going to estimate permeability and fracture half length. So with that, I'm finished and I'm happy to take any questions. I'll go on ahead and um, break out of this and come back to the uh, meeting. So let me get this. I'm going to yeah. stop sharing. Okay, did you guys stop sharing for me? Nope. Let me stop sharing. Okay, I stopped sharing. Very good. Yeah. Okay, Heike, I'm yours now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Blessing Cape. So you already asked the possible questions by yourself, and the presentation I do that. was, <laughs> yeah, it was very informative. So uh, there, there were some questions, but they deleted back. I think the the presentation includes all the answers. So uh, I think we came to the end of the webinar. So okay. SP, SP Turkey section wants to deep uh, express. Uh, deep gratitude for this informative presentation. So to the Dr. Blessing came and we we want to thank to the, all the participants for their contributions. Uh, I want to say goodbye and stay healthy to you all. So have a nice day. Thank you very, very much, Heike. Thank you all, Turkey section. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye.